Sweep! Sweep! <coughs> you, you know Sooty was asking you what was special about today? <coughs> yeah, well, when is it your birthday? <coughs> Next month, that's right. And when is it Sue's birthday? <coughs> Last month, that's right. And Scamp is? <coughs> April the 1st, correct. Now, when is it Sooty's birthday? his birthday. I think he's got it. For a hundred years, teddy bears have received the love and affection of generations. Only recently, a 90-year-old teddy was sold for 100,000 pounds. Sooty, no, I, no, no uh, come on, Sooty, I'm just a friend. Oh, Sooty. Happy birthday to you. Look at the music. Happy birthday to you. Sooty is almost as old as television itself. He was on our screens before Queen Elizabeth II, and according to the Guinness Book of Records, he hasn't been off since. Oh, well done. What did you think about that? Four, oh, 425. I got my sister Angela to see if she can wake him up. Angela! <coughs> Come here, dear. What can Just explain his phenomenal appeal? All right, Stufa, just relax. Mo, oh, why is that bear looking at me? Well, that's Sooty, Stufa. Sooty? I never heard of Sooty. <laughs> just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. That's a puppet. There's no putting one past you, is there? I mean, how can an, a, an, an inanimate object that doesn't speak, doesn't make a noise, how can it become an icon? I think of all the animals I've known about, this is the most unique, most original too. It's got such a good history already, Annie. If you think about it, you know, 50 years of um, of a puppet. He's. I hope somebody remembers me in 50 years' time. It kind of passed over these very simple human values, where you could have a lot of fun without getting aggressive. And, although there was a bit of aggression in there, wasn't there? Uh, be careful. With it. <laughs> Everybody likes to be naughty, and Sooty likes to be naughty, and Sooty's clever about it as well. And that kind of appeal is hopefully will go on forever and ever and ever until the world stops turning. <laughs> Got him. After all these years. <laughs> the amazing thing about him is that he's a legend, and he's never, ever said a word. He hasn't really done anything of any great cultural importance, but he's such a legend. Now, put it on nice and gently. That's it. Sooty, you are a naughty boy. And the great thing with Sooty was, and is, that you know what you're getting. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing devious, nothing complex, nothing... You don't need to go to night school to understand any aspect of it or be familiar with the work of obscure Swedish film directors or whatever. It just is what it is, and uh, I think that's rather wonderful. Now, it says, uh, beat the egg. Go on, beat it. Go! Oh. <sighs> Most people would strive for the status that, you know, Sooty's got, and he hasn't had to do anything. <laughs> what a life! <laughs> There's an air of frivolity in Granada Television's main studio. Sooty is 50. But, by coincidence, so is his partner of 25 years, Matthew. But whereas City looks set to go on forever, Matthew has had enough. This is his last show. When this studio session draws to a close, 
a large piece of television history will end with it. On the head. On the head, John. It's time for the bear to go it alone. Soot has always been there. He's always gone along like this. Other things have gone peak, very popular, trough. Peak, trough. You know actors, you see actors, they become stars and then they fall away. But there are certain actors that are always in everything. And that's a jobbing actor. That's what you should be if you want to be in the, in the theatre. And I think Soot is a jobbing puppet. Sooty's first partner was Harry Corbett, who worked as an electrical engineer in West Yorkshire. Guiseley, in fact, where he was born and raised. As a small boy, he lived with Brother Les above his parents' fish and chip shop. But this was no ordinary fish shop. It had originally belonged to Harry's uncle, the legendary Harry Ramston, king of fish parlours. And in this palace above such heady aromas, Harry's earliest talents began to emerge. Sooty would never have come into existence but for one factor. And that was that at a very early age, when he was six or seven, uh, Harry's mum discovered uh, that her young son had quite a talent for playing the piano. Popular as they are, fish and chips don't make you rich, unless you are Harry Ramsden, of course. But Harry's parents managed to scrape the money together for a brand new Beckstein piano the price of a house in those days. Which was intended for the both of us, of course, looking into the future, not realizing that I would uh, be such a dead loss. <laughs> in fact, Leslie wasn't quite the duffer he claims. He took to the saxophone just as Harry had taken to the piano, and as teenagers, they formed a band. The leader, of course, was Harry. I can see it now, his, his long fingers his, and, and his spready hands. You weren't surprised, really, that all this lovely music came from this piano because his hands were so big, they were so capable. It, it was a delight to listen to him. Harry's hands were his pride and joy. He would always attribute his success with Sooty to the span and flexibility of his musician's hands. But there was a problem. For some time, Harry had been having difficulty hearing the other members of the band. He kept asking them to play louder. The painful truth dawned gradually. He was going deaf. In the time that he was not hearing, he couldn't play the piano. And it was Marjorie who said to him, well, look, um, I don't know, why don't you take up conjuring or something? Do something with your hands. And if she was thinking, you know, other than that, Perhaps card tricks. And that's what he did. Harry the piano player became Harry the magician, with a little brown bear as his assistant. And the bear was a hit. Soon an operation would improve his hearing, but fate had already made its move, and the piano in future would take second billing to the bear. How Harry met his new partner has passed into family legend. They were in Blackpool, and uh, uh, the weather was bad. It was the glorious summer of 1948, a cold, windy day in Blackpool. The Corbett family, Harry, his wife Marjorie, and the two boys, had already spent one miserable, rain-sodden week cooped up in their boarding house. Now Harry was faced with another week. What to do? Once more into the breach, dear friends, goes the man who beats the ammunition shortage, the human cannonball. Just after the war, entertainment was in short supply. Surprise item this year, the Canine Cup Final. There isn't what was available was fun, but for a family of four, it soon became expensive. In the boarding house, apart from the wireless, there was nothing. The desperate Harry, battling his way along Blackpool's North Pier with one very bored child in tow, was suddenly stopped in his tracks. Harry takes uh, David onto North Pier, and they see this little furry bear. Harry comes back and says to Marjorie, I'd love to use this little puppet. Uh, he could be the conjurer's assistant. And then he says, but it's seven shillings and sixpence. So Marjorie says, never mind, buy it. And Harry does. They took it home and they played with it and I think Marjorie called it Teddy. Yes. 
and they decided it needed an original. <laughs> a new name, you see. And so now, because of the fact that he had this marvelous dexterity within his fingers and hands, his country assistant was a success. So once again, with Harry Hudson at the piano, Mabel at her table, to introduce us to some of her fellow Lancastrians from Longridge. At that time, Have a Go was the most popular show on the radio, and Harry, whilst still working as an electrical engineer, had started part-time as pianist and warm-up artist to the host, Wilfred Pickles. The regular pianist, Violet Carson, was otherwise engaged, although not yet in her more famous role as the dreaded Ina Sharples. Harry was good, but the bear was a sensation. So the show's producer, a neighbor of Harry's, persuaded him to audition for a new medium, television. He said to Harry, look, um, this little teddy bear of yours hasn't a lot of character. Um, can you do something about facial expression? Um, perhaps give it um, blacker eyebrows, do something about the ears. And he said, above all, give this little teddy bear a name. I think it was Marjorie that christened it. She put her hands up the chimney which we did have coal fires then, and she blacked its ears. And she says, halfway through the job, he's looking a bit sooty, isn't he? Ah. Well, within 24 hours, Harry appears on BBC television, and the rest is, as they say, history. to delight the thousands below. The Queen and her family step onto the balcony. Sooty's timing was perfect. The coronation of Queen Elizabeth II in 1953 boosted the sale of television sets in a way the manufacturers could only have dreamed of. Television sets weren't cheap either at 80 pounds each. They were a quarter the cost of a family car. As a matter of fact, Harry couldn't afford one for his own family. On the money the BBC paid him, he still needed the day job. I did want to give the, up the job. I, I was, I, you know, very nice job with security and pension and all that sort of thing. But uh, I wrote to the firm and said, can I have six Saturdays off to do this job? And they said, no, you can't. You can't mix television and engineering. What are all the other surveyors going to say? So I had to hand in my notice. But engineering was mixing with show business in a way that would change the world. A rapidly growing network of transmitters carried Sooty and his subversive bursts of anarchy further and further into the homes of the nation's children. Hello, anyone in? In fact, Harry Corbett had a real talent for the new medium. He and Sooty may have been lucky, but they were good. Well, how's business, eh? Just ticking over. Yes, I can hear it. You see, there was no competition in those days. It was the perfect spot at the weekend. Uh, well, it's Saturday tea time, and the whole family watched it. It's just like a flying saucer. And there was that stick, isn't it? And there was no ITV, so if anybody who had a television set saw Sooty. For young Matthew, he had the almost unique experience of seeing Dad on the television. Admittedly, not their television. I suppose my first memories of him were about 1950 five or so, I would be three, four years old, and I can remember uh, my father trying out little, little bits with me, you know, like showing me little bits of scenes to see whether I found that funny. One, two, one, two, okay? Ready? One, two, one, two. Hold it, hold it, hold it, just a minute. Oi, <clears throat> you, you, you're playing three in a bar, this is four in a bar. It's so different from Bill and Ben, and uh, the, the mule was just wooden, but this one was animated. By 1955, the success of Sooty was entrusted to top BBC director Trevor Hill. Just as George Martin was to do for the Beatles, Trevor was to take Sooty as far as his talents could go. Like Harry, he believed in the little bear. When it was coming up to Sooty, live transmissions on a Sunday, um, the crew used to sort of walk in with smiles, thinking, oh, good, it's Sooty Day today. 
Will all passengers for flight number 701 please hurry along to the departure bay? Just a moment, sir, just a moment. Uh, waiting here for boarding cards. When I first started working with Harry, I know he said um, to one of the staff, why does Trevor Hill spend so much time in rehearsal? And I was trying to get to the position where Sooty was not on the end of Harry's arm. Sooty was a person in his own right. Sooty had feet. Well, would you mind hurrying along there? Because the plane's due off in two minutes. It was amazing. There was nothing else to watch. And so anything that went on was watched by everybody who had a television, very unlike these days. And Sooty just took off. You're taking off backwards! You're taking off backwards! <laughs> Thank goodness. Well, at least they're going the right way now. The national papers said, you know, new television star is born. It was phenomenal. Stop it, stop it, stop taking it away. The picture, Sunday afternoon, if you would turn the television on, there was nothing on it, just a little dot, and it suddenly it went beep, and a man in a dicky bow said, good afternoon, this is BBC television from the north. And here for our younger viewers is Sooty. It was massive in those days because there was no competition. The only competition really were things like Ragtag and Bobtail, the Flower Pop Men, Prudence Kitten. Why is it that you can't do a program without getting into trouble? I... Oh, hello. Muffin the Mule was the real star of the BBC studios, a pioneer of post-war television. He was one of the anchors of Children's Hour and would have remained so, but for fate, once more taking a hand. Suddenly and tragically in 1955, Muffin's presenter, Annette Mills, died. The Mule, as it were, died with her. Muffin left a big gap. Sooty stepped in, but this time, Sooty was not alone. <laughs> Sooty uh, only talk, has ever talked, of course, to Harry or to Matthew. And I still hear Leslie, of course. I mean, Sweep. We know um, Sweep's bark. Come on, boy. <clears throat> oh, my God. <laughs> Leslie Corbett and his wife Muriel still live in their family home in Guiseley. He and his brother Harry were so close that they actually courted together. Harry with Marjorie, who worked at Harry Ramsden's, and Leslie with Muriel from Harry's old engineering works, and the four of them got married together. When Sooty needed a friend, there was nowhere else to turn. And Sweet came in. They said, would you like to do it? I said, yes, I'd love to. And I found myself reacting as Sweet would, would do. You know, if, somebody, if they threw a custard pie, that sweep up there, and I would duck. <laughs> Sausages! Being a saxophone player, I put this reed oh, no. in your mouth. And uh, I found that not only could I re reproduce sweep's voice, but I could do other, th other things. Now, it may actually be that Sweep is more popular than Sooty, but Sweep, let's face it, is stupid, and that's something that Sooty will never be. By 1955, the money was rolling in, not directly from telly, but from merchandising, and when commercial television hit our screens that year, Sooty was there, seen here in an advert on the very first week of ITV. Yeah. I'm just having a little game with Sooty. We've got two wooden bricks and an oxo cube. Now, I'm going to cover them up with this empty tube. You have a look through it, Sooty. That's it. Now, turn around, close your eyes, because I'm going to stack them up, and you've got to guess where the oxo cube is. No peeping. Here we go. Turn around, Sooty. Now, where is it? At the top. No, I'm afraid you're wrong, Sooty. But... Gosh! Well, how did you know it was there? Oh, Oxo's always tops. He's dead right, you know. You must be on quite a good screw now, shouldn't you? Hey? Yeah. What's it in the, is it in the hundreds? 
world. Thousands. Come on. In a few short years, Sooty had become a household name. With characteristic unselfishness, one of the first things he did was to buy his friend Harry a second-hand Bentley. I say, Sooty. Oh! Oh! father met the Queen at a, at a show back in 1955 and she said to him, Hello Mr Corbett, I'd just like to ask, has Sooty bonked you today? At which point uh, Sooty picked up his water pistol and my father said, he thought at that moment, shall Sooty squirt the Queen? Or shall Sooty just go over the right hand shoulder and get Prince Philip? In other words, do I want to go to the tower or do I just want to be arrested? Queen, her head's thrown back, her mouth is open. That is a belly laugh from her madge, and you don't see that very often. Harry's belief in Sooty was far more than just an affectation. So deep was his conviction that the bear was real that he actually drilled air holes in Sooty's travelling case. Sooty was an extension of Harry. Um, it was part of him. And uh, there was a story about when they once went on holiday and the children were still quite small and they set off and they were quite a long way from home. And Harry says, hang on, hang on, stop, stop, stop. We shall have to go back. And of course Marjorie said, what on earth for? He said, I've left him at home, him, of course, being sooty. Um, and they did. They had to go back home to collect sooty and he went on holiday with them. <laughs> I remember once when Matthew was a little boy and uh, it was his birthday time coming up and um, we went round the toy shops, you know, to look for something for him. And uh, we saw a lovely red fire engine. It, it really was a beauty. So we bought this uh, for Matthew and uh, as soon as Harry saw it, he said, that's great, I just need one like that for the programme. So Matthew never got his red fire engine. It went on one of the sooty shows. <laughs> to meet the demand for props and scenery, Harry had by now recruited his old workmate, Bill Garrett, as sooty's chief engineer. Bill Garrett is the behind-the-scenes wizard who works on the mechanics of a sooty show. He once worked with Harry Corbett in an electrical business. This was Harry's dream team. In this rare family photograph, we see the full team, Harry with Sooty, and next to him his brother Leslie, as Sweep. Alongside, there is wife Marjorie, then his old pal from Crompton's, Bill Garrett, and finally, tucked in at the end, a very young Matthew Corbett. Although Leslie was Sweep for 15 years, once, and only once, he was allowed upstairs, but only in disguise. <laughs> I know. Don't tell me I've seen you two on telly. <laughs> well, well. The thing I remember most, uh, well, I calling know? around one, one Sunday, uh, Harry was sitting at the fireside with Sooty on, and a script on his knee for the, for the Christmas show. We got, we got talking, Harry and I, and I could see out of my eye corner that uh, Sooty was sort of following the conversation, you know. It was, uh, yes, yeah. no. <laughs> Oh, God, <laughs> you can barely hear the words coming out of him. You see, it's, it's just those three fingers, that's all. And that's his head, the first finger, and those are his paws. Now, you've got to have a big stretch across here to get his paw out. If, if, his, if his finger's up there, then he's, he's crippled, you know. In London in the 60s, everything was swinging. It seemed the whole world was turning away from the dusty conventions of the post-war years towards a more relaxed view of politics, religion, and sex. But not at the BBC. A reporter from the Daily Mail came to see me. We were doing the show in Wimbledon. He said, any new puppets uh, coming along, Harry? And I said, no, I'm afraid not. Uh, I said, I was going to introduce one a girlfriend, but uh, the, the BBC wouldn't let me. He said, why not? I said, because they said it was sex creeping in. And we're sitting in the bar. Uh, Harry's at one end, and his manual dexterity and talents certainly included drawing. And there was a beer mat on the counter. 
and I can see this mat. Harry does finish his drawing, belts the mat, the mat up to me. I pick this up, and there is a rather voluptuous lady bear, and underneath he's written Sooty's girlfriend. And I look at this, and I say, mm hmm, over my dead body. When we sat down around the board, at the table in the boardroom, it was Dame Anne Godwin, member of Wales, who proclaimed in a very firm voice, we can't have sex with Sooty. And the next day in the Daily Mail, there was a big banner headline. It, uh, I remember reading, said BBC, a producer, Trevor Hill, 39, married, no children. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea. Sex should not come into this. And Fleet Street went mad. And um, the director general of the BBC, then Sir Hugh Green, all six foot ten of him, uncoiled, and he bent down to me and said, I think you should have let Sooty have a girlfriend, you know. After all that, we had to have a girlfriend because we'd got thousands of pounds worth of publicity. D did you want a voice something like this for Sue? My mother used to be the voice of Sue. But, you know, she's enjoyed working with us ever so much. Yes. <laughs> and, and she loves boys and girls. <laughs> and she loves Auntie Marjorie and Uncle Harry. And, and mm. it's a bit, bit of a job to stop her talking as well. Well, it is sometimes. She I do enjoy talking, Mr. Yeah. And I'm talking. very fond yes. of sooty and sweet. Mm. Sooty has learned just what to do at a pedestrian crossing. Away from the highly charged atmosphere of the BBC, another, lesser known side of Sooty can be seen in these rare films made privately by Harry and Trevor Hill. Not sweep. Oh dear, no. Because it's a crossing, he thinks he needn't worry. There is a car coming, and rather fast. Road safety was a major issue in the early 60s. So Harry did his best to enlist Sooty and Sweep's formidable influence in this set of remarkable and remarkably funny films. How much more ambitious Harry and Trevor were away from the constraints of Auntie BBC. Harry wasn't just interested in uh, Sooty and in Harry Corbett. Um, he put so much time and effort into uh, the National Children's Homes. Away from the public gaze, for more than 25 years, Sooty and the Corbett family have been visiting and living at Fountaindale School here in Mansfield. When working in the region, it is their base and home. For the children of Fountaindale's, Sooty is simply a friend. All our children have disabilities. They were all physically handicapped. And here, living in their school, was a top television star. Sooty never speaks. He's never yet spoken. And all children, especially children as they're growing and developing, they need a special friend. And he can listen to everything they say, and they know that he will never tell us all. He's very popular. But he, when he's in school, of course, with his shows, and every time he came, I, he always soaked me through, and I had, always had to go and change my shirt halfway, and they always enjoyed that. They absolutely loved it. He was a special person. In fact, Sooty continues to earn over a million pounds a year for charities through collecting boxes alone. The little yellow bear earns more than Harry and Matthew put together. We stopped at a tobacconist's for Harry to buy another packet of his favourite cigars. And as we came out of the shop, I can see this little lad now. And he came bounding up to Harry, all beaming, and he said to him, I know what you do, mister. I said, what do I do? He said, you put your hand up Sooty's bottom. <laughs> By 1967, the cosy working relationship with Trevor and the BBC, a relationship that had made television history, was under threat. In fact, Harry didn't know it, but his very relationship with Sooty was in peril. Will you both come up here? Come on. After 12 years, working boy and bear together. Uh, we had a new controller for BBC One who sent for me. He said, I think we need somebody else to present the program. We want Sooty. And uh, I think the idea was to introduce a young lady, and not the Sue type of young lady, but what they, I think, call today a bimbo. 
I found it rather difficult to explain um, to this particular gentleman, who was, after all, our boss, um, that the essential ingredient was the fact that here was Harry and there was Sooty, and in taking things from one another, Harry had coordination between his left hand and his right hand. Put the glass in. Oh, all right. Put the glass in. There we are. Is that all right? Useful, the magic one. Gosh, it's worked! My words! Well, how about that? <laughs> he was insistent um, that Harry was replaced. So I took Sooty into a quiet corner and I said, Sooty, I think the time has come, sadly, for you to Very take Harry funny. Corbett elsewhere. Very funny. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. I'm her yesterday man. As the decade of change that had been the 60s drew to a close, Sooty packed his bags and, with his old friend Harry, joined the migration to ITV. At Thames Television, they were treated like the stars they were, with all the glamour of the film set. In order to compete with the BBC, ITV had had to persuade lots of big names to break rank. Morecambe and Wise, Tony Hancock, Eamon Andrews, Tommy Cooper. Sooty and his pals were in fine company. But as with the Beatles, fans were divided over who was favourite. Sweep is unquestionably the strongest character. He's so well-intentioned. And he gets everything wrong. <laughs> I think Sue's quite hard done by. I think he's better than Mickey Mouse. Descriptions for Sooty would probably read goody goody, intellectual, bit naughty, but he's really the governor. He's old, old for his years. He's changed physically quite a lot. I mean, if you look at some of the old black and whites, he was slimmer, uh, smaller eyes, actually slightly more unfriendly, a bit more sort of rodent like, to be honest. Uh, and over the years, he's filled out, he's, he's got, he's put a bit of weight on, but then it can happen to the best of us, really. Sweep was always my favourite. And because when I was a kid, I always thought I could understand what Sweep was saying. Why are you digging like this, Sweep? You don't know. It's a dog sort of thing. I love Sweep. And Sweep singing is my favourite thing. Especially Sweep singing is Pavarotti's favourite. <laughs> I think it was Butch, the dog. You don't say. Hmm? You don't say. Hmm? You don't say. Who was it? He didn't say. Ramsbottom the snake. I love him, Woody Bucket, more in a bit. Him's not Ramsbottom. Sue is the whinging big sister. Sue is a bit of a bit of grass. She she tells on the other two, and I didn't used to like that. I've got a good mind to go and tell Matthew. At least I can be sure of one thing. If I've got the last ball, there won't be any more messing about with balls inside. She's a bit of an old-fashioned woman, which I kind of like, really. You never should. <laughs> tell you what, Sweep. Turn the tap on, fill my bath up. Now, if you do that for me, then I'll make you toast soldiers to go with your boiled egg at breakfast time. A deal? Okay, well, fill her up then, please. I've often said to him, but Matthew, I don't like saying that. It's miserable. And he says that in his experience, that is just how little girls behave. Along with the three stars, there was to be a fourth. Harry's younger son, Matthew, was much more of a clown than his father, and he fitted the brash new ITV style. Oh, no, not him again. The new tough ITV schedule demanded full-time commitment. Give me a clue. Sadly, that was more than one long-standing member of the team could offer. Leslie, sweep to a generation, had only ever worked in holidays from his proper job. He and his family needed security, and Harry couldn't offer it. I would have had to give up my job with the electricity board and uh, go full-time with Harry. 
And although, although the thing was good, I don't think it was at that time big enough for the two of us. So I very reluctantly had to give it up. He was a fine musician and a fine pianist, and uh, I used to love to hear him play, and he liked playing. I said to Harry, I think it would be nice if we had you with the band at one point. And he was very funny about it, and he went very off with me and strange, and we had a few dinners and we had a few meetings. And eventually he turned around and said, look, Daphne, love, you know, it's not that I don't want to and I don't like to, but I'm frightened. And I thought it was so sweet, it was so wonderful. He was terrified of being in amongst these eminent musicians because he had all the top session there. pianist with his own orchestra, he couldn't have been happier, but he had never had to work harder. The ITV schedule was a punishing one. He still had his show on the road, his commitment to his many schools and charities could never be ignored, and he and Marjorie had always enjoyed a party. On Christmas Eve, 1975, whilst staying at the Mayfair Hotel, Harry complained to Marjorie of a severe pain. It was a massive heart attack. An ambulance was called. He would survive, but in the hours that followed, the Corbett family, gathered around the bedside, had some hard decisions to make. Harry did survive the heart attack, but doctors warned him it was time to call it a day. His commitments to Thames and to the stage show were met by the speedy intervention of Matthew, who, as luck would have it, was presenting a series with Jerry Marsden, of Jerry and the Pacemakers fame, at the same studios. By stepping into the breach, Matthew saved Sooty, but had to sacrifice his own career. Harry Corbett was a remarkable man and, uh, and unique uh, in his handling of this puppet. He started something extraordinary. Matthew, I think, is very different and just as clever in his own way. How he managed to take over, I've no idea, because I think that's filial duty above and beyond. You got a present for him? Well, uh, no, let's oh. not do that. Harry and Matthew are very different, really. Um, Harry had the love of this little bear that he found and invented and who became another member of his family. Take it away then, go on. Here, Amy. He'd kind of uh, grown up with Sooty being kind of a, a younger brother, as it were. And you know what uh, boys think of younger brothers, don't they? <laughs> I think it's time that you saw me for what I really am. Yes, a dumbo. When you take over a, a business from your parent, you're open to all sorts of criticism. People say, ah, you know, he was, he was given that. So there's always that in the back of your mind. But I always like to, to make the analogy that, yes, I was given, handed it on a plate, but the plate was extremely hot with a crack down the middle, and it could easily have fallen apart. Don't be too sure, there's a rope on the floor. You could easily land on your face. The show extended, and rather than a little intimate puppet show, it became much more like a situation comedy. It's the pit, so they say, your spirits will shortly be sinking. <laughs> we found that the pace of the show kind of shot up, really. You find out your mistake, someone's been at the break. Be as quick as you can. Yes, we'll be. Sorry about the studio time. Okay, yes, it's very expensive. Okay. See you. Be very quick. quick. Is that quick enough? If you were on the move, 
in the charts, in the lower end of the charts, and you did Basil Brussett or Sooty, you could go top five overnight. I mean, it was a powerful program. Well, the whole world's talking about a boy named Sweep. He's a great, great dancer with the rock and roll feet. I remember the week I got on, they were trying to get uh, Ultravox on with mid -Jure, and they, they couldn't get on. We got on. I had to do it, of course, because, uh, because it's so much a part of my life, Sooty. So it was like a great privilege and a thrill to get onto the Sooty show. Honestly. So tell me, sweet, since you're a dog, after a hard day's work, do you feel dog tired? <laughs> Matthew was very kind to me and he said, Oh, you must come on the show and we'd love to have you on the show. And they had had really famous people, you know. And uh, when I got up there, of course, I found out that they really wanted Dale Winton, but they couldn't afford him. Why did I ever agree to do this job? Matthew picked up so quickly and did it and worked so well on something he didn't really want to do. He never really wanted to do that job at all. He wanted to be a great actor or write some music. What's the fastest fish in the world? Uh, I don't know. What is the fastest fish in the world? A motor pike. A motor pike? Matthew and I are actors, we're both actors, and we both finished up doing something that we swore we'd never do. I finished up presenting, and he, he finished up uh, doing Sooty. This is their final lesson, Mr. Corbett, and Sooty is just about to do his solo swim. Oh, really? Would you like to see it? I certainly would, would yes. You? All right. Yeah. Uh, sweet. Slowly but surely, Harry was recovering his strength. But during his long convalescence, he had been obliged to do a deal with Matthew. Matthew would only relinquish his own career in return for total ownership and control of Sooty. That's terrific. Now, swim back to our Sooty. bought the whole show, lock, stock and barrel, for £35,000. Harry, for his part, had to agree never to perform with Sooty again. All right, you can get out now, sweet. I, I wouldn't have touched it with a barge pole at one time, but, you know, as you grow older, you sort of look and you think, well, that's a nice car and that's a nice life and everything's <laughs> nice and perhaps he's not so stupid after all. Harry loved the little bear. They were very close. And I think Sooty was more important to Harry than probably anything else in the world. You know, we had a Mediterranean cruise, and uh, I took him down to London in a suitcase. A Unable to keep his side of the deal, Harry had taken to touring a one-man show around resorts in the southwest. When Matthew found out, there began what amounted to a turf war. It was a war that Harry was bound to lose. <clears throat> and so we went to sleep, and uh, at three o'clock in the morning, I'm tossing and turning, and thinking, the poor little devil. <laughs> <laughs> he's in his suitcase for a fortnight, and he's paying for the thing. You've got to be back at the clinic at uh, eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Would you let him do Sooty again? Well, no, not really, Terry. I think it's too confusing for the public, because, I mean, I've been doing this job now yeah, yeah. for 11 years, and I, it, was, it was quite difficult for me at first to, to make myself the person who was known as the person who worked with Sooty, and I had a, a lot of barriers to cross, because if you're a 40-year-old yeah, guy yeah. Uh, and you're out, uh, you, know, you don't watch children's television, how do you know who the new man is? And when your kid says, can we go and see him at the theatre? They say, but that's not the man, is it? It's the man who used to say bye and bye, everybody, you know, no hair and all that. So it was difficult. So you keep... I have to keep... You have to keep... Uh, yes, yes. Old Harry keep, away. Keep him down. Yeah. Right. No, I'm not keeping... Okay, is he... Is he... The Sooty was an extension of Harry. And perhaps it didn't get the same feel with Matthew. It, it used to be the, the Sooty show with Harry Corbett. But now it's the Matthew show with Sooty. Quite enough excitement for me for one day, but I must just say, actually, that I would never allow such a sweet and suit to climb up a ladder, and you mustn't do it either. By the early 80s, Matthew had become aware of a worrying trend in the studio's treatment of his scripts. Sooty's characteristic anarchy and irreverence was steadily being replaced by political correctness and a certain moral tone. It may have been the spirit of the age, but it wasn't the spirit of Sooty. Go on, Sooty, clean him up. I 
I'm going to say once more, there will be no further ball games inside this house. Friends. Friends. All right, look, and I really am sorry about everything I said to you. I must agree with you. Women are every bit as good as men. It's true, you know. I remember we did a show where there was a burglar. It was actually Mike Reed. He was a burglar, and he had stripy things, and he had a bag, a red swag bag. So a cartoon character, black mask. And he came in and burgled things. Look, the police will be here any minute. Give yourself up. Give yourself up? Never. Yeah, go on, you good... Hang on a minute. That, that's a banana. You can't hold me up with that. But it's a loaded banana. Woo! Go and sit over there. I want to. Yes, yeah, go, go on. Go and follow him and take it nice and easy. Dear Thames Television, I was appalled to see on the Sooty Show an actor using a banana as a gun. My young son hid behind a settee for over an hour. And now won't eat bananas. I can't wait to start the icing. And do you know what I think the problem is, Sue? What? I think jobs shouldn't be just for girls or boys. Yeah. It would be far better if everyone did what they wanted. They said the girls doing all the all the mamby pamby things, and the boys are going doing all the boys sort of things. And so I thought, well, I, they do have a point. So I did one program where the boys stayed behind and made ferry cakes, and Sue went and mended the motorbike sump. Uh, what, what is it, Sue? Going all lumpy. Well, I don't know what to do if it. Oh, one thing I do know, we can't have lumpy fairy cakes, can we? On the 17th of August, 1989, after a successful appearance with Sooty at Weymouth Pavilion, Harry Corbett died in his sleep. He'd spent his final years faithfully performing to audiences far from the television studios with his old pal. Not, of course, the real Sooty. Or was he? A legend, but not a leg end, for we saw but half of Sooty. But half was enough as laugh upon laugh rang out for children and those older, as he stood for square by Harry's shoulder. Squirting water, squeaking anarchy. Harry, one moment calm, the next one panicky. Mayhem reigned and chaos and a realization that a panda need not pander to the lowest, but bring such joy where'er he goest. With his life partner, Sue, how did they sweep the board and kipper too, a cat, a log of comedy, and confess it, who can forget Butch dogging their non-existent footsteps, the snake ram's bottom slithering in their soot steps, stepping into history with laughter and with love, as we happily joined them, hand in glove. In the early 90s, Sooty and his entourage joined Granada Television. Sweet, what are you doing with Sooty's magic wand? <laughs> right, onto the shop, scene nine. <laughs> this is my wife, Sally. I just want everybody to know that I love her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, And it's true. Matthew and Sally have children of their own, old enough to take over, but they don't want to. That's my working hand. Matthew had two boys, and uh, neither of them were interested like children are these days. They don't always want to do what the parents have done. Uh, and I think Harry would have been quite disappointed to know that Sooty was going out of the family. And I see no reason why he shouldn't go on for another 50 years, because I think there will always be a place for pure, gentle entertainment. 1952 till this year, it's in the Guinness Book of Records. It's the longest running TV show of any. Not bad for a one foot tall teddy bear. <laughs> so this really is the end of a dynasty. But Sooty goes on and in the process notches up another world record, the most expensive teddy bear ever sold. In order to finance his retirement, Matthew sold the bear for almost one and a half million pounds. Not a bad return for seven shillings and sixpence. Happy birthday, Sooty! <laughs> or in today's money, 37 and a half pence. Now can I retire? Yay! Yay! Thank you very much. Thank you all for a memorable day. Yay!